Turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12. We'll pick up our reading at verse 49. We're continuing our study through the Gospel of Luke. We're, we're better than halfway through it. And uh, you recall when we, we begun this, I anticipated Sunday mornings and Sunday nights, uh, or, uh, but it just hasn't worked out that way. So now uh, it seems like it's taken longer than, uh, than what was planned, but after all, people say, well, I just, you know, why don't you just preach Jesus? Well, the Gospels are about Jesus, and uh, so <laughs> we're doing that, and we're preaching the Bible, so, uh, you know, hey, uh, we're doing what we need to be doing, but since we're 12 chapters into Luke, we'll stick with it until we're done. Luke chapter 12, verse 49, if you can, when you find that, if you could stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. Luke chapter 12, verse 49. If you found that, say amen. amen. Now I know you can do it, so I expect to hear that somewhat during the sermon. <laughs> Fooled you, didn't I? Luke chapter 12, verse 49. Jesus is speaking on the heels of uh, his uh, previous uh, admonition that the Lord is coming back. Uh, the uh, Lord comes back and expects his servants to be faithful. And those that are not faithful will be uh, torn asunder, will be uh, cut in two. And those people who uh, are ignorant of him will be, uh, will be damned, will be uh, uh, beaten, uh, will be punished. But those people who knew the master's will and still did not prepare himself according to his will are going to receive the greater punishment. Now in verse 49... Jesus says, I came to send fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how distressed I am till it is accomplished. Do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? I tell you not at all, but rather division. For from now on, Five in one house will be divided, three against two, and two against three. Father will be divided against son, and son against daughter, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Then he also said to the multitudes, whenever you see a cloud arising out of the west, immediately you say, a shower is coming, and so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say, there will be hot weather. And there is. Hypocrites. You can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it you do not discern this time? Yes, and why even of yourselves do you not judge what is right? When you go with your adversary to the magistrate, make every effort along the way to settle with him, lest he drag you to the judge, the judge deliver you to the officer, and the officer throw you into prison. I tell you, you shall not depart from there, so you have paid the very last mite, the very last penny. Let us pray. Father, we pray, God, that you would speak by your Spirit through your servant. Help us to see the truth that is contained here within these verses. We're thankful, Father, that we have a Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who teaches us. We're thankful, Father, that we have uh, this book this holy book that we might be able to study and to read. And Father, we know that it is already blessed. But we pray now, Father, that you would bless the reading of it to the hearing of our ears, that by your Spirit we might take it and apply it in our lives. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Last week, in, in, in speaking about the return of the Master... Uh, we begun with an illustration of an expectant war bride waiting anxiously and preparing feverishly for her returning husband who was delayed. Remember that? All two of you. Very good. Thank you. Well, this week we want to look at it, uh, perhaps, and, and this is a way of helping us keep things straight in our minds. Maybe we're going to look at it this week from his perspective, the soldier's perspective, from his vantage point. Uh, th there were things that caused his delay, and there was an anticipation that built to a fevered 
pitch until every obstacle was overcome. Perhaps he got last-minute orders that he had to fulfill before he could get on the train. Every last uh, a minute, or every last minute task had been accomplished. Every transportation hurdle had been cleared. Perhaps a train broke down. Perhaps there was a flat tire on his way to the station. Whatever the case may be for the delay, he had to knock down each one of these so that he might be able to claim his prize, which was a return to his bride, so that he might reach his long-awaited reunion, home, destination point. Well, in our text today, we see that Jesus was passionately longing for the completion of his ministry, the completion of the work that the Father had given for him to do. Remember from Luke chapter 9, verse 51, we, we said that Jesus set his face steadfastly toward Jerusalem. In other words, with purpose, he turned and was working his way slowly but surely to Jerusalem. And not just Jerusalem as a city, but for the work that lay ahead for him, which was the cross. The cross, his redemptive work, his atoning sacrificial death upon the cross awaited him. For this purpose he had been sent. That he was now prepared and anticipating the work that was given to him by the Father. In John chapter 6, verse 38. John 6, 38. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that all he has given me I should not lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. Christ has a purpose and a plan. The plan belongs to God. God has purposed since eternity past to save, to redeem sinners. And Christ has agreed to accomplish this salvation. And when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman and born under the law to redeem those that are under the law. Born under the curse of the law. It, 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 all those that are under the law are under the curse of the law. What is the curse of the law? Death? Punishment? When we fail to live up to God's standards, which is the law, he, there is a curse to be expected. The blessings and the curses of the law. Blessings for obedience and curses for disobedience. But here's the rub. None of us can live up to the law. The law was given to us as a taskmaster to teach us that none of us are good enough to meet God's standards. So then what then must we do? Well, in the Old Testament economy, there had to be the shedding of blood. There had to be turtle doves whose necks were wrung. There had to be bulls and goats and heifers to be slaughtered. There had to be blood uh, placed upon the altar as an expiation for the sins of the people. There had to be a penalty because the people were under the curse of the law. And Jesus now has come to redeem those that were under the curse of the law. And this is his purpose for him to buy back those who were sold into sin. And this is what he anticipates when he says, I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of the Father. He's chomping at the bit here to get home, kind of like that old boy who was discharged from the military. He's ready to come home, and he's willing to, to cross every obstacle and clear every hurdle to get to where he needs to be. This is what is unfolding for us in the latter part of Luke chapter 12. And we're going to divide this today into uh, three or four parts, but we're going to look first at the fire that he speaks of and a baptism and then division and discernment and settlement, if we get that far. Look at verse 49. We begin with fire, don't we? I came to send fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. I came, the word there, and if some of your translations might, might be, I came to cast fire upon the earth. And that's the right translation, by the way. That's the clearest 
translation of that word in the original language. I came to cast fire. Kind of like uh, imagine a, 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 a field and somebody just taking a, a torch and chucking it out in the middle of the hay and watch it just spread from there. This is what Jesus is talking about. I've come to cast a torch into the hay and the stubble of this world. I came to send fire on the earth. Now, does that mean the entire earth, or does that just mean the nation of Israel? Either way, it works. Either way, it works. There are some commentators that say, well, he means this for Israel. Others say, no, this is for everybody. And either way, it works, because whatever started there in Israel has certainly spread throughout the world, hasn't it? It has changed uh, uh, the world, this gospel that has been flung into the mix into the midst of, of sinners, of fallen human beings. Now, we've got to remember the context here, that, te uh, that Jesus is teaching his disciples about their readiness and their faithfulness. Now, when the return of the master, he, he expects uh, to find them ready. Even though he returns at an unexpected hour, he expects the person, his servants, to be ready. And he said that uh, that. Uh, we said last week that this thought of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ ought to affect our ethics. In other words, how we live before God and our fellow man. The thought that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back ought to make us live our lives in a certain sense, with a certain sense of anticipation, expectation, and striving for holiness striving so for faithfulness that God, that, that Christ when he comes for his bride will find us ready. So many today keep wanting to look off to the future. And, and listen, I think that we ought to be prepared. The Bible tells us that the Lord could come at any moment. Let us be ready. Let us be prepared. And I know that there are, the, there are those of us that have very strong views concerning the return of the Lord. However, I'm pretty sure that none of us are 100% correct. The only thing that we know for sure is that he's coming again. And since he's coming again, he wants to find us ready. But my friend, most of, of humanity will have met the Lord Jesus Christ by the time everything is said and done. Most of humanity will have met the Lord not by way of the return, but by way of the grave. We are not guaranteed our next breath. Are you ready? If you had to stand before the divine tribunal today to give an account for your life, would you be ready? I hope and pray that you are. But Jesus is teaching them that we've got to live in a certain way before God and before our fellow man. But now he connects his future coming with judgment, uh, his future coming in judgment with the immediate work that is going to transpire at the end of his ministry, his, his death, his suffering. In other words, everything that he's got to endure before his return, everything that we know of, everything that you and I are experiencing today, all of it began with fire. All of it began with fire. That there's nothing going on in the last 2,000 years in the name of the church and in the name of the work of God that did not begin with the fire that Jesus Christ says, I came to throw on the earth. And at this point in time, in verse 49, he says, I wish it were already kindled. You know what kindling is. It's what you use to start a fire. He says, I wish it were already started. I wish that it was already uh, 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 blazing. Anything that we have experienced, any of the revivals that swept through uh, the world, even the Reformation, any of this, uh, the, the establishment of the church, it all started with fire that Jesus is speaking of right here, so it must be important. But what is this fire, this fire that we're talking about? What is the fire that he references here? Now, some people will say, well, that's a reference to the Holy Spirit. In the day of Pentecost, you know, the tongues of fire came down and, and you know, and the church was born. Others say, no, this is the word of God that, that changes people and, God, and, and presents the gospel to people. And 
Other people will say, no, this is judgment. While others say, no, this, Jesus is talking about purity purification. Well, I say to you today that um, yes, they're all right. Every one of them. What I believe it is, and, and I've struggled with this this week, and I've, I've sought other commentators, and some I've agreed with and others I haven't, but uh, what I believe that he is meaning here is it's an all-encompassing composite full understanding that it is the spirit and fire and uh, uh, the, the spirit and the word of God and judgment and purification. All of it wrapped up in this one concept of fire. Luke chapter 3 verse 16, uh, John the Baptist is, uh, is preaching and he says the one that's coming is coming uh, uh, for a purpose, verse 16, and he says, uh, I indeed baptize you with water, but the one mightier than I am coming, I'm not uh, worthy to loose the sandal strap on, on his shoe, and he says, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So the Holy Spirit and fire go together, don't they? So the Holy Spirit. But verse 17 says, his winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So there's judgment, isn't it? Well, we go look throughout uh, the Bible at the purifying effect of God and of truth. One place that we could look is Isaiah chapter 6. When Isaiah looked and saw the Lord, God Almighty, high, exalted, lifted up, he saw the angelic beings flying to and fro, worshiping this thrice holy God, and immediately he realized how unholy Isaiah was. Isaiah's like, woe unto me. I'm all undone. In other words, I, I'm going to die. My friend, when you get a glimpse of the glory and the majesty and the holiness of God, you will have an understanding of the depth of human depravity and just how undone you really are. And I am convinced that the reason why there's not as much passion in churches today and why there are, there's not enough fire from the pulpits today is because we have lost sense and sight of the holiness of Almighty God. That we go about our lives offering Him the halt and the lame and thinking that He's going to be satisfied with this. My friend, this has changed my life. I'm not the same person that I was when I got here. However many years ago it's been now. And I'm trying to instill this in you, that if you can see the holiness of God, it changes everything. You can't be satisfied with the status quo. You can't be satisfied with just what you think God, uh, you can offer God. No, there is, a, there is a fire here that purifies us. And God sent the angelic being down to uh, place the burning hot coals upon his lips when Isaiah says, hey, I, I'm all undone and I'm unclean and I, I bear, I, you know, I'm, I, I've got unclean lips. And here come the hot fire, the hot, hot coal, and was placed upon his lips and he said, now they're clean. Go and preach. Or Hebrews, as I read in your hearing this morning, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29. Our God, he's not to be trifled with, is he? God isn't your buddy and your pal. God isn't some cosmic slot machine or ATM. He's not a jack-in-the-box where you crank him and let him pop out when you want him. Otherwise, you put him back in and go about your way. Our God is a consuming fire. He's a consuming fire. He dwells in unapproachable light. You think that you're going to climb to him? He would consume you unless he hide himself in the form of his son. It's the only way we can see him. This is the only way that we can approach Almighty God is that we've got to be able to see Jesus. We've got to go through Jesus. The holiness of God burns with 
pure and powerful flame that either uh, uh, consumes or purifies. One commenter said that the fire that he was referring to here is spiritual power exercised by the Lord through the Spirit and the Word to the undoing of those who reject him and to the refining of those who believe in him. He's talking about fire here. Fire that either consumes or purifies, and it depends upon the nature of what it is burning as to whether it would be consumed or purified. Hay and stubble is consumed, but gold is refined and purified. When the flame is put to gold, the dross is driven off. When it's put to the precious metals, the impurities uh, have to exit. This is what he's talking about here. And he says, how I wish it were already kindled. He is anticipating, anxiously anticipating the fire to change lives. Has this fire purified you? Has this fire purified you in this life? Because if it hasn't, it will consume you in the next life. There'll be nothing left. And my friend, the reason I am so passionate about this is that I am convinced that a great number of people who name the name of Christ don't know him at all. I'm convinced of it. I look around and I see and I hear and I watch and I just sit on the park bench of life. You'll be consumed in the next life if you're not purified in this one. Well, verse 15. But, he says, and this is closely related to the fire of judgment. But before it can be kindled, there must be a baptism. I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how distressed I am till it is accomplished. Before the kindling of the fire, a baptism. Now, in Greek uh, literature, the word baptism here always means plunged, submerged, and then they use it to uh, entail a severely trying experience. You know, like uh, tragedies in your life. You know what happens when there's a tragic event in your life? Everything else fades to the distance, to the background, and it's just this. Whatever this is that's consuming, this is what he's talking about right here, baptism. There is a consuming severely trying experience that I must endure. I have a baptism to be baptized with. Now, what baptism it can be is water baptism. He's already had that at the beginning of his ministry in chapter 3. It's already been that. And since verse 49 uh, speaks of this first coming, he's not talking about his second coming anymore. He says right there, I came to send fire. I'm here to send fire. Not I will come to send fire, I'm here. And then verse 51, do you suppose that I came to, to give peace on earth? I tell you not at all, but rather division. Do you think I'm coming? No, I'm here. So he's talking about something in the immediate context here, isn't he? And what he is referring to is his crucifixion. This is a fiery trial, a severely trying experience that Jesus Christ is going to be submerged in suffering and in death, that the wrath of God is going to fall on Jesus Christ on behalf of sinners. On behalf of sinners. He says, I must be baptized by the wrath of God. Before he can cast the consuming fire on earth to purify or to consume, he must first endure the, skirt, the scorching heat of divine judgment. What do you think Calvary was? The wrath of God poured out on his own son. God did it. You don't like that, do you? God crushed his son. 
I am surprised at the number of people that, be, that, that, that are offended by that terminology, that verbiage. As if they never read their Bibles. For it pleased the Lord to bruise him. <laughs> I mean, this is not, I'm not making this stuff up. I'm not the one that invented the terminology and the verbiage. But let me tell you what, it's already in the Bible. And then we let the Bible dictate how we think about God. And if the Bible says it pleased the Lord to crush him, then what it means is that it was God who crushed him and he was glad to do it on your behalf or my behalf. Amen. And if you dis despise that sacred and wondrous act of redemption upon the cross, you are trampling Christ under your feet and there remains no more sacrifice for your sins. And this is why in Hebrews chapter 12, he warns us. You think people were, were terrified at Sinai? How terrified ought we, ought, uh, ought we to be when we have despised what Mount Zion offers us? How much more when he can shake heaven and earth with this gospel message? How much more should we be in fear and reverence of Almighty God? Oh, he says, I've, the wrath of God must be poured out on me. I've got a baptism. And how distressed I am until it is accomplished. To lest they accomplished, finished. A variation of this word is uttered from Christ upon the cross. To tell us die. It is finished. Same, uh, same derivative of the same word. Paid in full. This is no uh, accident of language. Christ is meaning to tell them that his uh, sacrificial death on the cross is a baptism in the, wrath, uh, in, the, in the wrath of God. And this is what he is anticipating. However, he is distressed. The word here for distressed means afflicted, anxious, uneasy, troubled, or grieving. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, was distressed. Now, this is not quite a year before Gethsemane. Now, we know that he was distressed on that night, that the flesh, the, the, the human side of Jesus, that, that Jesus was 100% man, 100% God, but on that night, the flesh, of course, bucked up in anticipation of the suffering. How could it not? And he cries, Lord, if there's, if, Father, if there be any other way, remove this cup from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. I didn't come to do my will. I came to do your will. And if you want me to drink it, I'll drink it dry. And he did. But my friend, let us not uh, kid ourselves. Jesus Christ lived under a perpetual state of Gethsemane's agony. I wonder as he stood there in the temple that day as a 12-year-old kid and he was teaching them. Remember that? They come looking for him and they hey, where you been, boy? You, uh, we're looking for you. We're halfway home and you're, you're still here. He said, what, don't you think I ought to be about my father's business? I wonder on that day if he was feeling the, uh, as he saw sacrifices and he saw all of the, the, the implements of, of Old Testament worship that was pointing to him, I wonder if the weight and, and the distress of Calvary come weighing down on him that day. I'm certain that it did. Every stage, every phase in his life, he knew he was under the agony of Gethsemane. He knew he is distressed is what it says right here. Paul uses the same word in, in Philippians chapter 1, verse 23, when he says that uh, I'm hard-pressed. I'm hard-pressed. I am distressed. Sune sunekamai. I am di distressed between the two, having a des desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better, or to remain in the flesh, which is more needful for you. Remember that? We preach that and, and say that a lot of the funerals, don't we? Is it better to, to go home to be with Jesus or to stay here and to serve him because you guys need me? That's the, and he says, I'm distressed about that. What we have here is a holy impatience. 
that Jesus Christ will not find satisfaction until he performs that which he has come to do, that which the Father since eternity past has tasked for him to do, that he is governed by this until it finally and fully be accomplished. Jesus said, I'm distressed about this. What baptism is it? It's the cross. Water baptism was an inauguration, one moderator said, one commentator said. But Calvary was the coronation. You see, there's no crown without a cross. Let that be a lesson to all of us who want smooth sailing in this life. We're called to share our master's suffering and to do whatever it takes, and to, and to sweat it out if need be, and to wrestle and fight and contend for the faith, running with endurance, whatever is necessary. All that matters is that we see Jesus. Get me to Jesus. That's all that matters. Not how many friends you have, not how much money you have, not what kind of home you have, titles, positions. None of these things matter. Get me to Jesus because he's all we need in the end. There's a baptism that Jesus is referring to here. And this baptism brings about a division. Look at verse 51. Do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. Jesus' teaching divided people, didn't it? He divided the wheat from the chaff. He divides the sheep from the goats. He divided the faithful from the unfaithful. He said, that he that is not for me is against me. If you're not gathering for me, you're scattering it abroad. Jesus' teaching divides, and it still does. But there are people that are upset with me because of my teaching. And if I'm just teaching what the Bible says, then in actuality, by extension, they're, mad, they're upset with Jesus. And I can't help that. Maybe I need to be kinder in my presentation sometimes. But, you know, hey, we've got to discern between and decide between what is offense and what is conviction. And most of the time it's conviction. And, and, and conviction is a mercy of God. That he's extending this for us to feel as miserable as we do about something that is contrary to his will and his law so that we might turn from it and come back to him. Instead, we want to gnaw on it like a dog uh, gnaws on a soup bone. And nobody's going to get it away from me. And listen, the preacher's not going to be able to say anything. He said it, he made me mad, and it's his fault, and it's just the way it is. My friend, again, I remind you, I've got a job, and that is to fit you for eternity. And if the teaching of Jesus divided in Jesus' day, it certainly will in this day, because this day is a wicked day, a wicked generation, just as in Jesus' day. But here, he plainly and forcefully drives the point home. It is his baptism. It is his deed. It is his action. It is his accomplishment of the will of the Father that is going to divide people in this life and in the next. And that's the difference. This isn't about his teaching dividing people. This is about his deeds, his activity offending people and dividing people. And if he says, I come to do the will of the Father, and if the Father's will divides people and offends people, there's no hope for them. I told the kids on Wednesday night, uh, one of them said, well, you, you can't talk like that to me or something like that, or, you know, they just back and forth, and said, that's, that's offensive. And I said to them, I thank God for the day somebody offended me with the gospel. I thank God for the day that someone t called me, uh, uh, told me that I was unwise. Because had it not been for that, where would I be today? It would be like a doctor, right, who gives you a, a, a diagnosis that upsets you, makes you cry. You say, what gives this doctor the right to tell me 
to say something to me that makes me cry and makes me feel bad. What gives him the right? Well, the fact that he is diagnosing you with a terminal cancer, if, it not treat if it's not treated, that gives him the right, for he seeks to save your life. And the same is true for the preacher. The same is true for a teacher. The same is true for the gospel of Jesus Christ. It must offend us so that it will save us. It must. Look at verse 51. He asks a question. This is a question and answer that dispels most of the liberal theology, uh, theology of the last century and a half and exposes the futility of the seeker-sensitive ministry paradigm that is so prevalent in our day today. Let us make the inside of the church like the outside of the church so that sinners will feel more comfortable in coming in. Let's bring peace in our communities. Look at verse 51. Everybody fix your eyes on verse 51. He asked a question. Do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? The answer from the Jews is yes. We do suppose that. This is what we were expecting. We were in messianic anticipation of peace, that uh, the, the prophetic anticipation of Isaiah 9, verse 6, for example, the prince of peace. This is what we're expecting. And perhaps you, in your, with your Christian tradition and Christian background, uh, would say, yeah, I expect Jesus to bring peace because, after all, you know, the angels on, at the birth of Jesus, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Uh, or uh, Jesus saying, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Or perhaps as he spoke to the woman with the issue of blood, go in peace. So we're expecting peace all the time, peace, peace. But the Bible warns us, especially for preachers, about telling people peace, peace, where there is no peace. It's dangerous. It's dangerous for the people who listen and hear and live uh, uh, accordingly. The, it is dangerous for the people who imbibe in such teaching, but it's especially dangerous for preachers. The Bible says that we ought not be uh, quick to be in teaching of the church because there's going to be a greater condemnation for false teachers. Greater responsibility. Who much is given, much is required. So again, if I'm worried about offending you or offending God, I'm always going to worry about offending God at your expense. I'm sorry. Not sorry. Okay? It's the way it is. But is Jesus the peacemaker? Well, let's just see what Jesus says about this. Do you suppose I came to bring peace on earth? I tell you, not at all but rather division. I tell you not at all. Does this not upset our current contemporary paradigm for church? That we want people to feel as comfortable inside a church house as they would on a, in a bar, on a bar stool on a Saturday night. And the only way that we can really entice people to come is if when they get there, Everybody is happy, happy, joy, joy, having a fun, doing the wave, doing the worm. We've got a rocking band, and we've got, you know, we're going to take this thing on the road, and we've got sound machines and all this stuff. Worldliness. When Jesus said, I didn't come to make them feel comfortable, I came to bring division. The answer that he gives is not at all. And in the original Greek, I'm not, I know you don't like it when I throw out the Greek terms, but it's uke, uke, but it's spelled O-U-C-H-I. So a hillbilly pronunciation of that would be ouchie. <laughs> and it is an ouchie, isn't it? Because it makes an ouchie because it upsets our apple cart. We've been doing things wrong for the last 75 years, is what this says, at least 75 years. We've been doing things wrong. That instead of us trying to make the, the inside of the church like the outside of the church, we ought to make the inside of the church as much like what God wants, holy and set apart and sanctified and reverent, 
and that we've put forth the notion or at least the idea that there is a fear of God and that there's something different about what transpires in a house of God than what you can get at a ball game or a halftime show or at your local bar or pub. I think that people ought to, think, to know when they come into a house of, of faith there's something different about what's going on. And I think Jesus wants us to know this, that he didn't bring, he didn't come to make sinners more comfortable. Matter of fact, Matthew chapter 10, verse 34. Matthew chapter 10 comes to mind. I'm going to read it. Matthew chapter 10, about verse 34. Yes, verse 34. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. What does a sword do? It divides. For I have come to set a man against his father, daughter against her mother. So he's, he is duplicating Luke's instruction here, isn't he? Look at verse 37. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds, uh, who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. How many of your idols just got knocked down right there? How many of our idols get knocked down right there? How many ouchies are there? Ouch. Jesus didn't come to, to, to make this your best life. If this is your best life, woe is you. No, he came to bring peace, but peace with God. Okay? And uh, uh, so what is this division that he is talking about here? His activity, okay? His activity, the redemptive work of Jesus divides people. Our response to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ divides people. And even though he brings peace with God, it's not uh, ultimately going to be uh, uh, peace on earth until he returns. And even then, there's going to be a lot of people cast out into outer darkness as he purges his good creation of wicked people. It won't be complete until the end of the age, but it's the redemptive work of Jesus that divides people, and it still does. In the meantime, this division, as he says right there from verse 52 to 53, the, the, the division is going to be evident and, and obvious and really seen and experienced in even the most tenderest relations of our lives, as in the family, as in the family unit. Now, we're not to seek division within our families, per se. What he is meaning here is that it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Why? Because those people who despise the gospel will eventually despise those people who are changed by the gospel. And this is a hard saying, but it's just the way it is. I have seen far too many Christians compromise their faith so as not to offend their family. I have seen far too many people water down what they believe and stifle their own gospel speech so as to maintain relationships between their children or their parents. I refer you again to Matthew chapter 10 so that you don't think Chad's making this stuff up. Verse 37, he who loves father or mother more than me isn't worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So perhaps the reason why everything is so, uh, so cozy within your family, if your whole family is, uh, is, is, is lost, maybe the reason that everything is so cozy and they're so glad to have you around is because you're not being bold enough with the gospel. And when I, listen, again, I'm not saying that we need to go out there and uh, do our best to, to poke our fingers in their eyes. No. But what I'm saying is that these people, if we're living properly, if we're living in light of eternity, that the Lord will return at any moment. And if he does, these people that I love are going to be cast into a devil's hell. If we're living with that sense of certainty and finality, then, my friend, we ought to show it to them. 
they ought to be able to sense it in us and by, uh, by virtue of, uh, of our devotion to the Lord and to his gospel, they will either be threatened by us or perhaps they might have preferred us the way we used to be. I used to have a lot of friends. Not so much anymore because I used to be the fun guy. And now my, my definition of fun is, doesn't match up with these former friends. And um, so I rarely see them or hear from them at all. I used to have family members that, we, you know, we could really have great conversations and, you know, a lot, of, lot to do with. But not anymore. And I've never accused anybody. I've never thrown stones at anybody. I've never beaten anybody with the Bible. They know what I stand for. They, they know what I preach. They know what I believe, and they don't want anything to do with it. This is the division that Jesus is referring to here. This is the division that must necessarily come if we're uh, to share in his sufferings. This is part of it. And my friend, it even happens in churches, doesn't it? Why? Because there's unbelievers sitting in every church. That's why. And oftentimes they'll cause division and schisms or they'll tear down rather than building anything up. But I want to tell you today, if you're here today, you're, re- you're true and, and, and you belong to the Lord and he is your great ambition in life, I want to remind you that your first allegiance is is to Jesus Christ. And his claims on our lives will always bring conflict. Always. With someone. Especially the darker it gets outside. Well, it calls for discernment, doesn't it? Verse 54, then he said to the multitudes, whenever you see a cloud rising out of the west, immediately you say a shower is coming, and so it is. When you see... He says, you're good weather men. They didn't have the Weather Channel and all these apps and stuff that we have today, and they're still wrong, right? With all the technology, they're still wrong. But he says, you know that when you see a cloud coming out of the west, it's going to be rain. And you, you know when the wind blows up out of the south, it's going to get real hot because it's coming over the desert there. It's going to get real hot. You know this. He's talking to Jewish people here. You know this. But how is it? You hypocrites. Notice he calls them hypocrites. He's not calling them fools here. He's calling them hypocrites. He he said, how can you discern the weather, but you don't discern this time? The time in which you're living right now, that you don't understand what's going on. You can look at a cloud and know what it's going to do. You can feel a breeze, know what it's going to do, but you can't look at the Lord of glory healing the sick Uh, raising the dead, walking on water, and and preaching the good news of the kingdom of God, and you can't tell that your Messiah is here. Has anything changed for today? What Jesus is telling in these last few verses of chapter 12 is that it is time to decide. Either you're going to be with him or you're going to be against him. And when you see the, the gathering clouds, you know it's going to be a storm. My friend, any of us with any kind of discernment at all can just look at the sign of the times. And we can tell, you know deep down inside, don't you? You might be here just as happy as a pig in mud at the way things are going. And, and you might be. But if you're honest with yourself, you know things can't continue like this. Something's going to give. If the Lord doesn't return, there's going to be, everything that you and I know is going to crack up. All of it. It can't stay like this. I can remember back in the 90s hearing a preacher say, uh, uh, or actually a man that was invited uh, to a church, he, he was a, a, a seminarian, and he was invited to a church to speak, and he said, this is like the greatest pressure cooker that, that America has ever experienced, and it can't stay like this. Eventually it's going to blow. And that was back in the 90s. Imagine what it's like now. It's just the pressure is ramped up, 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 up. It can't stay like this. Something's going to give. And even if you think, well, well, listen, we're making great progress, but think about this. Every, the more that the secular world tries to fix everything, the more goes wrong. The more they booger it up. So they, they can't fix complex problems with their simple platitudes and tweets. 
And they're simple solutions. So what they do instead is they turn against God because they'll have a welcoming uh, audience when they say there is no God or you're a hater or you're you know, this, that, and the other because you're a no good Christian. That's easy. Blame everything on the Christians. And that's where it's going right now. And ask the Jews from the 20th century how things went in Germany when the Nazis blamed the Jews for every economic, every social, every environmental problem that they had as a nation. Ask how that went for them. You'd be hard-pressed to find any of them because most of them went to the gas chambers. Are you ready for that here? Because God sent his son who brings the vision. And he divides us, doesn't he? Verse 56, you hypocrites, you religious leaders, you can't, you need to be like the sons of Issachar. Remember that from 1 Corinthians? Uh, that they, they discerned the times, right? That they were wise men, for, uh, or First Chronicles chapter 12, I believe it is. They were wise men who, uh, who could tell what time it was, in essence. And he said, you need to be like them. You need to know the times, and you should know the times. And because you don't recognize the times, you're hypocrites. Because in, deep down inside, you refuse. You know, but you refuse. And the same is true today. Deep down inside, you know things can't stay like this. Deep down inside, you know that there's a better way. Deep down inside, you know that God, if there is a God, he can't be satisfied with what he sees. And if there is a God, he's got to set things straight. Deep down inside, you know this. And what's more is, deep down inside, you know there is a God because there's no other solution. There's no other answer to why we're even here. We say this to the kids on Wednesday night. We set it down on the street corner in Shinston. God is. And the only other alternative is that the universe always is. But my friend, the universe is composed of matter, isn't it? Where did that matter come from? You don't get something from nothing. It doesn't work like that in nature. But God is a spirit. He is above all. He is transcendent. He is beyond all. So the answer to this is there either has to be a God or the universe, and the universe can't be, so there is a God. Next question. That's simple. Well, let's look at the settlement. Not only is he telling us to decide and to discern what the time is, but he's telling us we better settle our accounts. Verse 57, yes, and why even of yourself do you not judge what is right? Can't you tell what he is talking about here and using a reference from the secular uh, 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 civil courts as he's telling them judgment is coming and you need to get right with God. He's using this, uh, this issue or an example of a court settlement. Any wise attorney will tell you if there's any doubt or any question as to what the verdict is going to be, it's always best to settle out of court. If you think there's a chance that you're going to have to pay the full penalty, you better settle out of court. And that's what he's referring to there in verse 58, right? 59, he says, when you're going, you're being sued, and on your way to the magistrate, isn't it better for you to settle your accounts then, settle out of court, in case when you get before the judge, the judge declares you ultimately uh, responsible for whatever the case may be, and as a result, you've got to pay the full penalty. You've got to pay the full penalty. You've got to pay every last penny. What he's calling for us to do here, in light of, the, of everything that he has discussed in chapter 12, he's coming again. He expects to find us ready. He expects to find us in anticipation. And that, uh, that there are those who are divided apart from him simply because they have no faith in his redemptive work. There are people that are talking a good talk, but all it is is just talk. There's no walk that backs it up. Other people are walking what they perceive to be a good walk, 
but there's no heart devotion at the core of it all, which means they're divided as well. They're cast aside. And he's saying, I'm coming again. There's going to be certain judgment that, that this fire is coming of judgment and purify. The only way you'll be purified is if you settle your accounts out of court. Are you with me? How do we do that? We've got to know and acknowledge that we're guilty. We're guilty. If you and I had to stand before in a court of law today and have our thoughts and our deeds exposed to the letter of the law, not, we're all murderers and cheaters and we're thieves. We're, we're everything that God says is punishable by death, every one of us. We don't want to go to court. We're guilty. There isn't even the slightest chance that we'll get off on this. We're, we're guilty of sin. The old expression rings true, doesn't it? We're guilty. And, and I'm guilty before a holy God. That God is perfect and pristine and holy, and I am not. And as a matter of fact, even the good things that I do are filthiness in his eyes. And never good enough. We got to believe that there's coming a judgment. We just got to know it. And because there's coming a judgment, because we're going to hear, if we don't settle out of court, we're going to hear. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. We're going to hear that. It's only then that we can see how helpless our plight is. Whether it be in Jesus' day or whether it be in our day, it's only then that we realize just how helpless our plight is, and that thus we need to settle. And how can we settle? We have nothing to offer God. We have nothing to offer Him. We can't say, hey, listen, I'll, I'll, I'll slip this to you and let me off the hook. We have nothing to offer. We have nothing to impress God. Nothing to, to sway His judgment. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us. That there is none righteous, no, not one. That all we like sheep have gone astray. There's no hope. And God is completely unenthralled or unimpressed with you, despite what your favorite church song might tell you on K-Love. I don't even throw that out there. God doesn't need you to be God. He is from everlasting to everlasting. He has always been God, and he always will be, and he doesn't really need you. And there's nothing you can't bribe him, and you certainly can't bribe him with halt and lame sacrifices, because whatever it is you offer is never going to be good enough. What should we do? How is it then we can settle? It's only that Jesus Christ offers to settle on our behalf. He steps to the fore and says, I'll pay the debt. You don't even have to go to court. This is the baptism. This is the cross. This is redemption. This is atonement. And apart from it, you're damned. Apart from it, you're divided from him. Apart from it, you have no hope. Jesus steps to the forefront and he says, I'll settle it, and I'll settle it completely, and I'll settle it finally, and we're going to see from chapter 13 forward how it is that he's going to do that. Let us bow our heads. Father, if there be one here today that is apart from your saving knowledge,